Hello and welcome to this week's Different League show sponsored by Betfred, the last one before Christmas. And if you're not already in tier four, you soon will be. But football continues. How thankful we are of that. And we are thankful that Gabby Agbon Lahore has graced us with his presence. <laughs> Gabby, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. A bit wet from the rain on the way in, but I'll you know what? okay I now. I saw you on Insta and I sent you a text. I thought you were really looking dapper and the next time I saw you, you were 20 yards ahead of me. No umbrella walking in the pouring rain. How are you, dry yet? Yeah, I thought the weather was better up south. <laughs> no, it's, it's clearly really not. Good to see you anyway. Merry Christmas, or is it a Merry Christmas with what's going on at the moment? How important is it that, that football continues? Yeah, I think it's massive. I think um, in the first lockdown in March when football was stopped, it made it even harder for people. I mean, football gives you that release of when you are stuck at home and under a lockdown, at least you've got games to watch. So it, it, it's a lot better, you know, and hopefully football can continue and um, give people that bit of hope that they can watch the games and it'll get them through the lockdown. Are you the same as well, you know, like a football fan as much as a, an ex-player, just happy that you can watch football? Yeah, um, my missus complains a lot because <laughs> every game that's on, I'm watching, she's like, do you have to watch this? I'm like, yep. It's, You're not uh, alone in yeah, that, It's Stoke me. versus Derby. Yeah, I've got what's that as well. So, um, yeah, every game that's on, you know, um, especially now at the moment with a Saturday game, a Sunday game, there's a, there's a game on every two hours, isn't there? So yeah. very enjoyable and hopefully that doesn't stop because it'll be an even, even awful January if there's no football on. A football feast in the Agbon Lahore household. <laughs> uh, Mark, look, we all want it to continue, but the Ipswich physio, and they've had their problems, of course, with, with COVID amongst many other clubs. Matt Bayard has suggested a circuit breaker of two weeks. His argument that it might not be different in two weeks' time, but it's a chance to re-establish protocols. But do we not need to just get games in while we can? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a, a dangerous um, way to go about it, because as he says, if you... You know, there's no guarantee that in two weeks it will be any better. I think the, the mistake is that protocol should have been in there from the start. They've had since March to, um, you know, to work on a protocol um, for, you know, if if not for the, the season that finished, um, you know, back in the summer, certainly for this season. There have been inconsistencies in the way the EFL have dealt with it. I know Sunderland weren't happy that they had to play with a very weakened team against AFC Wimbledon um, earlier on. And there were other teams having fewer cases, but then having games... Um, called off, so I think it is um, it is important that they get a protocol in place, but that sh could and should be happening while the games are going on. It doesn't have to um, sort of go hand in hand that you have to stop the matches to get a yeah. protocol in place. And if they are stopped, which a lot are at the moment, but if you if you stop for everyone, is that not going to make the second half of the season even crazier? Yeah. Is it possible to to go into to, yeah. to June for the end that's, of the season? That's why it's it's so important to get the games played because we've got the Euros coming up. There's not going to be enough time to play all these extra games. Look at Aston Villa already. They've got two games in hand. They have to be um, fitted in. One of them's against Manchester City, who are, who are going to be in um, the Champions League. So it's going to be really difficult for um, most leagues, especially the Premier League, to fit these games in. So I'm sure it's going to be something that play the games while you can. Yeah. The teams that have to have games called off will have to fit them in. We all want football to continue. Um, look, Arsenal lost heavily to Manchester City last night in the Carabao Cup. No wins in eight in all competitions now. They're 15th in the league. Alan Shearer is saying he's not sure Arsenal will stay up, which is absolutely incredible when you think about it. Big pressure on Mikel Arteta. Some are, are calling for his head already. What do you say? I think it's difficult. Um, I, I do agree with Alan Shearer. I think no game in the Premier League is guaranteed three points. You can't look at previous years. You might have looked at, OK, we're going to get these three points in this game, but you can't now. I mean, Arsenal have got Chelsea coming up, which at home you expect Chelsea to, to win at the Emirates, even to win the game. I think after that's West Brom. West Brom are going to be fighting for their lives. They're going to fancy themselves against Arsenal. So I really think it is a relegation battle. And I feel the longer they keep losing, the more their players are not going to turn up and start to hide and maybe miss games for injury. So I think it's really going to be tough for Arteta. And it might come to the stage where... As much as Arsenal as a club want to give him time, they might have to just stop it and bring in someone who can keep them up. Well, we'll expand on that. And I want to ask you what you made of his comments. And I'm a big fan. I've told Mark I think he needs to be given time and patience and money as well. We know in this world yeah. that's not always the case. But 
what he said last week. Last year we beat Everton with a 25% chance of winning. Last weekend it was a 67% chance of winning any Premier League game in history and a 9% chance of losing and you lose. 3% against Burnley and you lose. 7% against Spurs and you lose. What did you make when you, when you heard those comments? I didn't quite understand them. I don't understand how you, have, how you got a 9% chance of losing to Everton when Everton are in better form. Like, I'm sure, where did you get these, these percentages from? I think it's um, silly when you start talking like that. I think even the owners and chief executives will look at them comments and think that maybe Arteta is starting to sound like he's making excuses. I think you've just got to look into every game. You're, you're going to say lose it there, weren't you? Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't <laughs> think I could say that on here. So. But I think you look at Arsenal, you've got to go into every game. It's Arsenal Football Club. They're a massive football club, massive players there on crazy money. They've got to go into every game looking to win. They can't be saying that percentage-wise you shouldn't beat Everton because that's nonsense. Mark, how do you see it? Well, I think in terms of those stats, it was all about um, expected goals and sort of the chances that Arsenal created against what their opponents created, put them two together and in the history of sort of their, the database that the analysts have got, um, it gives you a percentage <laughs> chance of you know, how often you should win those games. Well, every game's different, isn't it? Yeah. I, so I, some players might not turn up for a game, so they're going to have their more more shots against them. I, it's and nonsense. I also think, you know, game state comes into it. So Tottenham were 2 new up against them very early on, just sat back. And Arsenal dominated the second half in terms of possession and sort of, you know, crosses and stuff like that. But um, that was basically what Tottenham wanted them to do. And I think it was the same, um, you know, in other games they played. I mean, Burnley are going to play that way. They're going to wait for a set piece and then look to score from it. They're not going to cut you open. And I think he's making a lot of excuses at the, at the moment, um, you know, too many excuses. And, I mean, he said against Man City that he thought they dominated for 25, 30 minutes mm. of the game. I didn't think they dominated sort of any, that they were in the game for a while, but they, they certainly didn't dominate any of it. And then, you know, he, he sort of keeps going back to sort of different situations about, um, you know, uh, that unlucky and... I mean, I think he needs to start taking responsibility, actually. And I think that's the difference between a number two and, and being the main man. As a number two, you don't have to take that responsibility, but he's coming out and not accept... I don't think he's accepting enough responsibilities. It's his team, his decisions, whether it's a backup goalkeeper, um, you know, whether it's Xhaka, you know, the players getting sent off. That all comes... Ultimately, it falls on him. How much responsibility should he take? How much responsibility should the players take? How many leaders do they have? I think it's 50-50. Um, I think the manager's got to take 50% um, of responsibility because he's coming to this um, job, you know. Probably think it's going to be a lot easier than what, what, what it was. It's different when you're with Pep Guardiola and he's got De Bruyne, Walker. Pep Guardiola spent a lot of money on this team and Arteta has tried to go to Arsenal and do the same with them players, but they're not good enough. So I think he maybe needs to change his tactics, his way of playing with the players he's got. Just try and get some wins. If that's change your to five at the back and playing a counter attack against teams, then do it just to get wins. But two I words, do think two yeah. words keep on coming up: Mesut Özil. Yeah, you know what? It's difficult. I think that Özil should be in the twenty-five. There's no doubt about that. Yes, he doesn't work hard, but Yamas Rodriguez doesn't work hard. He still plays. You know, build a team around him. Or a game like Burnley, twenty minutes, you need a goal. Bring him on. You don't need hard workers for the last 20 minutes. It's nice to have the option to bring him on. I feel like there must be something going on maybe from above where they've said he's not involved. I don't think he will be back mm. in January. I think he'll be done. But Ozil, he's not working less hard than, say, William or, or Pepe. I mean, I don't see them sort of, you know, doing great work for the team, um, you know, and, and yet they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're picked. It so. would have surprised me if Ozil, every time Arsenal lose, is cracking open a, a can <laughs> of, a can of um, Budweiser and having a, a toast because but we've, all been, the we've point all been then? there. He's, he's not, yeah, but it, that's not being a team player then, is it? No, but we've all been there. Like, if, you're, if you are getting bombed... How many Budweiser's did you have back in the day? <laughs> no, but if you're getting bombed by a club, yes, you want your teammate to do well, but you know if that team's not doing well and losing, you're, you're, the manager's one step away from getting the sack, so you're buzzing as a player thinking like, all right, yes, I don't want my team to lose, but when they lose, Arteta's on his way out, so maybe a new manager comes in, I'm back in. How that's, about the novel idea? Sounds, that's what players do. How about the novel idea of actually getting down, working hard and showing that you can you can do what he's asking yeah, you to I do? Think, I think that's what I would do in this position. I'll be posting only videos on Instagram and Twitter, I'll be posting with me doing shooting sessions, doing running, doing extra work on the training ground, 
and then Arsenal fans are going to see it and then you might have to bring it back in January but you see him as Ozil, he tweets after games and you know so but it's a tough situation we don't know what's going on between them I mean managers and players do fall out but you just look at the way Willian's playing. I mean, he's, has he had one shot on target in like 11 yeah. games or something? Something crazy mm, stat mm. where he's, he's not even getting shots off. It's like, when does it stop? You need to start making changes and maybe bring in players that want to play for the club. OK, final one on, on this then, because we, t- we could talk for hours. Yeah. What would it take, and I reiterate, I am an Arteta fan, but what would it take for Arsenal to be in a position where the board say, this cannot go on? Well, I, I was on the show and said I thought it would be if they lost to Burnley, and uh, Edu came out afterwards and said he's doing a great job. And I'm thinking, mm-hmm. not doing a great job. I mean, you can say he's, you know, we believe in him and... Um, you know, we believe in the process and it, it will get better. You can't say he's doing a great job because yeah. he's not. Um, I feel like that. I feel like they've backed themselves into a corner now where they will stick with him. But if they lose these Christmas games they've got against West Brom and, and Brighton, I think it is, and that they end up, I don't think they. I don't think they will go down. I don't think they're necessarily in a relegation battle. But if you lose, if you only get say one or two points from them games, the table looks a hell of a lot worse going into January. Mm-hmm. Um, then surely it's time. What do you think? I, th- I think if they lose to Chelsea, which is more or less guaranteed, um, I think when you start looking at the games against West Brom and you start losing against teams in the bottom three, then the board's going to be a bit like, all right, this is worse than it than we thought it was. And you start to lose to West Brom, then you lose to Brighton, and them teams start to be a point away from you. Then it's a bit like, you know, we've got the FA Cup weekend coming in January. It's a perfect time to make a change. And I don't think he, he survives if he doesn't win against West Brom, because really? that, that's the sort of game where you, you must be winning, otherwise you lose into a, or dropping points against a relegation um, battler. I, I just don't see, I, you know, if you're the board or, or whoever makes a decision, whether it's one person or a collective um, sort of uh, process, like where is your faith in that Arteta will turn it around? Because um, there's nothing to fall back on. You're, you're basically hoping that Pep Guardiola has given him... It's not like he sort of worked at Aston Villa or something before and you say, oh, we, we believe in that, we've seen him, he's done it before. He's, he's not done it before. So, I mean, I'm surprised they've stuck with him, which makes me think that maybe they, they will give him sort of longer than, than it, many people. Well, I think it depends as well. When you start seeing players not running and working hard, if you watch a Chelsea game and you see that happen, and West Brom, you say you see the players not working hard, down in tools... That's when I think it's it's game over for a manager because, yes, he might be able to turn it around, but if I'm the board, I'm looking at, like, these players aren't reacting to his manager, he's lost them, and then you've got no choice. But me, I agree with you. I will stick with him and give him money in January, let him bring in a few players, and I'm sure he'll turn it around because the days of keep sacking managers, we don't want to see. what What's next? They've sacked Emery, Wenger left, they sack Arteta. Who comes in? No big manager is really going to take this job at the moment for Arsenal, so... I do think um, they should keep giving time and giving money. OK, well, let's have a look at this week's social section where we see what's being posted, some funny things across social media in the last week. Uh, Gabby, Mark, have a look at this one. It's a, it's a tweet from Peter Crouch. He talked about uh, Lionel Messi. It's incredible how he's broke Pele's record of 644 goals for a single club. Crouchy's put, um, that's outstanding, but my record of two goals for 644 <laughs> clubs still stands. <laughs> he did play for a few. More than you or not? Yeah, he did. A lot more clubs. But Crouchy, great player, wasn't he? And you probably can't even name a team he didn't play for. He yeah. moved around that much. But, yeah, maybe he just loved the signing on fees, moving clubs. <laughs> it looks like he could still play as well in the way, the way he is. He was never the quickest. He'd, um, I mean, he was at Villa when um, Gabby was there, but Gabby was only in the youth team. But it would have been a great partnership, wouldn't it? I yeah. think, actually, that, um, you know, being able to feed off these flick Yeah, perfect, yeah. What was he like? I remember being in the youth team. He just had the funny character. You know, when you walk through the um, corridors, you'd see him always dancing and, you know, having a laugh. <laughs> just that robots. character. Yeah, do, you know, <laughs> having, having fun with um, his football and... A great player of a great career. Yeah, certainly. OK, let's have a look at the next one. And it is Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville. Just explain this one. Uh, I mean, this is um, Carragher just taking the mick out of Neville's obsession with Paul Pogba. Uh, player to watch for 2021 on Monday Night Football. 
Nev once again. He's not given up on Paul Pogba. <laughs> We've given up on Mikel Arteta, or certainly <laughs> I have. I know maybe you haven't, but he's not giving up on, on Paul Pogba. I get the feeling it'll be the year 2026 and um, Gary Neville will be going, this will be Pogba's year. We'll find a position <laughs> for him. It's left back, it's centre back or whatever. You know, he, he still shows touches. Against Sheffield United, in fairness, he played a couple of lovely passes. You just want to see it more often. Yeah. Against Sheffield United, he showed a couple of touches. That's the best <laughs> that Mark can say about him. On a, on a serious note, though, what, what is your take on, on Paul Pogba? I think, like you said there, Sheffield United game, he played really well for me. And then he doesn't play the game after. I think he needs consistency. And even the manager's got to give him that by um, continuing to play him. I think Leeds was a perfect game to play him in, get his confidence up again, and then um, get some goals and assists. But you just want to see it. Um, every time he plays for Manchester United, but mm. part of you thinks sometimes that maybe... Does he have to go? He, I don't think he has to go, but maybe he might want to go, or maybe the club might think to themselves, you know what, it's not a bad idea you go. I think it suits both parties. Should they let him where, go? Yeah, I think they should let him go, and I think he'll want to go, go and play in Spain or back in Italy, and they've got Van der Beek there ready to come in, so I think it suits both the club and the player for him to move on. Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville, the Anton Deck of the football world. <laughs> OK, let's move on now to a different league a Q&A section where you get the chance to win a £25 Amazon voucher if your question is read out to our guest. Gabby, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. OK, Christopher Coyne has asked you, what was your favourite goal of your career? Um, it's a tough one because... You scored so many. No, I didn't. I didn't score many. No, I think... <laughs> Most important and then favourite, I think my favourite goal would have probably been um, Arsenal away when um, I got on the end of a counter-attack and um, smashed the ball in against um, William Gallas. But then most important would have probably been my second um, goal against Blues at St Andrews. Just the whole atmosphere, the adrenaline of the game and to score in the 85th minute to win the game against your local um, rivals was massive and I think yeah it's hard to choose but maybe I'll go with the Arsenal because of um, the sort of goal it was. Just that one on, on the derby though to do that against Birmingham in the 85th minute scoring the winner that's you can't dream for much more can you? No and I think what, was, what like? was so good about that was that I'd done it two years before so it was the second time I'd done it in the exact same part of the stadium near enough the same minute of the game and I feel like just that adrenaline, you're in front of your, your own fans when you score, they're on that side. And then um, you know you won the game because the 85th minute, they've got no chance of getting back into it really. It's hard to explain, but I think it's one of those moments where you can be 60, 70 years old and you still remember it. You remember exactly the buzz that you had when you felt it. And um, speaking to a lad at Villa, Jack Grealish, who'd done it um, a couple of years ago, he said the same. He says, no After better getting feeling. hit by that idiot. Yeah, as well. and I feel like you'd rather score at their ground than your own ground because of the adrenaline of, you know, you've upset 20,000 people in the stadium. So it's something I'll never forget and um, lifetime memories. It's unlike you to want to upset anyone, Gary. No, you're, never. You're not, not a controversial me. person never. at all. Uh, James Cook has asked you, how close were you to making the 2010 World Cup squad? Um, not very close. I didn't make it. <laughs> no, were you um, waiting for the call? <laughs> no, I, don't, I, th I think um, yeah, I think I was in good form that year, but I feel like probably the peak time where you need to be informed. The last couple of months of the season, I don't think I scored many goals. I feel I got my goals until like March. I think April, May, I probably didn't score many goals, so maybe that cost me. But at that time, there were so many choices for England. I think there was Heskey, Rooney, Bent. Carlton Cole, Defoe, there were so many choices at that time for England to choose and um, it was maybe just a bit unlucky not to make it. OK, um, I've got one for you as well. I won't take, claim the voucher, okay. but you and I are working together next week, aren't we? Yep. Chelsea Villa game. £50 bet, the winner goes to a charity of yep, their choice. 100%. I feel the way I watch Chelsea play against West Ham, I'll gladly have that bet with you. <laughs> We'll talk about Chelsea and Villa in just a little bit. Uh, look, get your chance, get your questions in uh, for next week. A chance to win a £25 Amazon voucher. Simon Grayson is our guest with us in seven days' time. OK, let's have a look ahead at some selected Premier League games uh, this weekend. Boxing Day, of course. How special was Boxing Day for you, Gabby? 
Um, yeah, I enjoy playing on Boxing Day. Um, suspended a couple of times on Boxing Day, <laughs> as purpose. you do. I can't say. <laughs> no, but I think after being with your family on Christmas Day, you know, always nice to get out there and then um, get back to your football. Do you know what one I didn't like was when you were playing Newcastle Boxing Day because you were travelling Christmas Day to Newcastle, four hour drive or a flight. So I'm sure some players won't be enjoying that. But for us as fans, you know, to have so much football on Boxing Day, um, we're buzzing. Well, no one's travelling to, to Newcastle this weekend. But look, Leicester mm -hmm. against Man U first up is our game preview one. Uh, now, we're speaking before Manchester United play Everton in the Carabao Cup quarter final, but both teams had great results last weekend. Let, let's start with United. They sit third, win the game in hand, they go second, just two points off Liverpool. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's a great manager, isn't he? Yes, but this Man United could go and get beat 3 0 by Leicester. We don't know which Manchester United's going to turn up. They win a couple of games and we're all Ollie at the wheel. Then they go and lose to, to teams where they shouldn't lose. And we're back at square one where they lose points and end up fifth or sixth. So it'll be interesting to see if he can get them firing again. I've seen the way Fernandez is playing and Rashford. They look unstoppable. So I do fancy them to go and beat Leicester. Mark, in, in all seriousness, I, I don't still don't see him as the long-term answer. Poch is my man and I've said that and nothing changes. But he's handled himself with great dignity and what must be the most difficult job, if not in English football, in world football right now. Yeah, I, I think he has. And I, that's probably where the goodwill towards him comes in that, that uh, particularly those connected with United want him to do well. And so uh, he, he maybe will get a, a, you know, a, a bit more time. I think it helps, but it helps when you've got good players and he's got really good players. That, that's, and I think that comes part of the argument is that they've got a squad really that, I, that should be doing better on a more consistent basis. And you see it with um, particularly I mean, the form that Rashford is in and Bruno Fernandes, um, you know, that those players will want to and believe that they should be challenging for titles and we shouldn't be ultimately surprised that a team with a wage bill as big as Manchester United is up there because they should be up there and when we're criticising them before um, it's because they weren't up there and you know, they, they should be challenging for titles you know, why shouldn't they? Brendan Rodgers is a man on the up isn't he? Leicester are second as we, as we speak might be good for the United or maybe even the Arsenal job but that, that's another question how do you see Leicester at, at the moment and, and for this season? Well if you look at Leicester's home record this season it's been I think it's second worst in the whole league it's been awful and I think they're at home is that right against mm. Manchester United so if they continue that home form, you can see a Manchester United win. And it's been frustrating for Brendan Rodgers because they've lost to Fulham, they've lost to Everton and Aston Villa at home as well this season. Games where they probably expect to win. And if they'd won them games, they'd probably be top of the table. So I think it's still going to be a, a frustrating season for Leicester in that way. But I still think they've got a good chance of making the top four. I just hope they don't miss out like they did last season where they're in and around the top four with five or six games to go and then end up missing out. In terms of this game, and it is right you mentioned Leicester's home form, you've always got two teams who are better on the counter, haven't you? So how do you see it panning out? I 100% see Leicester doing what they did against Manchester City, and um, I see them sitting back and looking to play the counter-attack. Jamie Vardy's got an injury, hopefully he's back for the game, but it's suited for him to play against Lindelof and Maguire on the counter-attack. He'll be looking forward to that game, and it's more onus on Manchester United, even though it's a way to go out and attack because it's Manchester United, they're not um, meant to be sitting back. OK, so you're saying that Leicester will sit back, yep. uh, United won't particularly want to do that, but I get the feeling you're going to say a United win here. What's your bet Fred selection? I just can't um, I just can't see past the way Fernandes is playing. I mean, I, just said, I said earlier in the week, I'll take him before Kevin De Bruyne now. Just the way he's playing, everything he touches is an assist or goal. He's just getting that team playing football. Rashford looks frightening on the pitch. Martial, Greenwood, you've got Pogba there. I just feel that Manchester United team, um, they'll see it where they are on the table now and know that they can get into a title race with Liverpool if they win this game. So United to win? Yeah, United for me. That's a great debate though, isn't it? Um, Fernandes or De Bruyne, yeah. one for another day. What's your bet, Fred, selection? Uh, over two and a half goals. I think it will be really exciting. All of Manchester United's away games this season have featured at least three goals, and they've scored three goals at least in, in all of their games as well. So I can only see this being a really fun way to start Boxing Day. Yeah, four defeats out of five coming at home for Leicester. Yeah. I think both teams are better on the counter-attack. I think this will suit United more. Both teams to score, but United for win. Yeah. We've gone United all round, haven't we? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. OK, game preview two. It is Aston Villa against Crystal <laughs> Palace. Now, how good was that win at the Hawthorns? But, I mean, 
it's only because Albion went down to 10 men, wasn't it? No, I think if you look before the, before the sending off, you know, Villa come out of the traps like um, straight at West Brom. Um, they got the early goal, Greece was doing some good stuff. So I think it might have been a tighter game, but I feel even if they had 11 men, Villa were the better team and had too much for West Brom. And it was a good win because they had some frustrating results um, previously, Aston Villa. And um, after a great start of the season, it's good to get back to winning ways. I saw you on Insta beforehand showing one of your winning goals in, in, in that game as well. Very good finish, I have to say. <laughs> o- Ollie Watkins, very unlucky at the moment. Another goal ruled yeah. out for offside. From one Aston Villa striker to another, how do you think he's doing in a, in a Villa shirt? I think he's doing very well. I mean, I, I said before, I'd love to have played in this Aston Villa team in my prime with the likes of Grealish running past players and threading you through and you're getting a lot of chances, you know. And you look at Watkins, every game he's getting chances and that's what you want. I think he's missed a few chances, had a few offsides, but when you're getting these chances, you know you're going to eventually turn them into goals because you keep getting them every game, and I'm sure that'll be the same against Palace. Yeah, Villa currently sit ninth, but two games in hand. They could go second if they win both. Easier said than done, but what is possible for for Villa this season? What's the aim in what is a very strange season all all, all round? I think the aim is to stay up, first of all, get get to 40 points. No, I think to get to 40 points, and then you start thinking to yourself, what else can we do? I think other teams have said that, um, that are doing well so far. Even West Ham have said that as well. Get to 40 points as quick as possible, then see where you can go. Go into each game and try and win. Even if you're playing Manchester City, Liverpool, Manchester United, go into these games and try and win. And that's how Aston Villa are playing every game. You don't see Aston Villa changing their formation to two defensive midfielders in any game. It's the same midfield every game and the same tactics because they know on their day they can score goals and they've got a good defence. So for me, stay up, but try and finish around mid-table. If you can get 12th, 13th, great season. Even then, now you'd say 12th or 13th? Yeah, yeah, I would be. Because yes, they're doing very well, but we've seen in previous games, they've got it in them to lose some games. And um, yeah, so I, I still think 12th, 13th. Okay, Palace doing well, but what on earth happened <laughs> against Liverpool? It's, it's okay to lose, but by seven? Yeah, I think the early goal obviously did you know, changed the way that Palace probably approached the game. Everything that, that Liverpool sort of struck seemed to go in. There were some, some great goals, um, you know, on the counter-attack or Salah scored, you know, great individual goals. So um, just one of those games. I mean, it can happen. Aston Villa, you know, put seven past Liverpool. So if Liverpool can concede seven on a given day, then so can Crystal Palace. Just a really bad day. And I, I suppose once it gets to three and four, you probably just lose a bit of heart and then the and you, if you haven't got those home fans to kind, if you're playing in an empty stadium yeah. and you're losing by three or four, like, are you really going to push it? You know, there, there yeah, are but, more but, important moments to come. Yeah, but also you don't want to be, you don't want fans to be there. <laughs> no. Three, four down. No. Uh, I, I, I feel like if you have fans though, you're not going to lose seven. No. Once, once you get to three, the fans are going to be that fuming that you've got no choice to, to, to work harder. You lose seven with fans, you know you're getting it. <laughs> so is this a good time or a bad time to play Palace? I think it can be, it's probably a bad time because I look at that team, you know, they've got Benteke coming back, he was on good form before his red card. And I think Roy Hodgson will be getting his team up for this game. And the way both teams play, I mean, it's going to be an open game because Pally started to throw Eze, Sahar forward, AU, Benteke, Vida lot to throw players forward. And I'm, I'm looking at the game and I've gone for a draw. I can see, wow. I can see a, a high scoring draw, maybe a 2 Not 2 or 3 villa. 3. I think. They've got a chance of winning, but I just see Palace are dangerous. I mean, Villa, they've played well, they've defended well, but when Zahar's on his game, we've seen in recent weeks, when Zahar and Eze are on their game and Benteke, they're a threat, and I think they'll score goals. OK. What's more, your I'm more confident than Gary. I'm a bit surprised. I'm going for a, an Aston Villa win. Um, I think you know, they've kept three clean sheets on the spin. They're unlucky not to beat Burnley. Had a lot of shots, completely dominated. Uh, West Brom and Palace are, haven't had a clean sheet since the opening weekend. Mm. So, well, yeah, I'm, I'm quite confident here. Villa win. Yeah, no team has kept more clean sheets than Villa this season. As yeah. you say, first game of the season, Crystal Palace kept a clean sheet. Haven't since. I'm going to go Villa win to nil. Yeah. Can't believe you're the only one not saying Villa. I oh, know, I know, because I'm, I'm trying to be reverse psychology. I'm like, <laughs> if I Can't say lose. that and they <laughs> win, you know, like it's better, isn't it? OK, game preview three. What a game it is as well. Arsenal against Chelsea. And, and look, we went big about Arsenal and Mikel Arteta at the start of the show. But Gabby, if you were an Arsenal player right now, how much pressure would you be feeling coming into this game? And what's going to be a very difficult game for them? 
I don't know, I think I'd, if, I, if I was told I wasn't playing, I'd be like, that's fine with me. I think <laughs> all the players in that team now, you'd be looking at this game against a Chelsea side who were poor against West Ham and got the win. But you look at Chelsea's squad and the, the players they can play, I feel like I'll be very, very um, nervous for the result for Arsenal because it's got a big win for Chelsea written all over it. If you were Mikel Arteta, how would you set up? You touched on it earlier, but you know, how would you try to bounce back and get, get something out of this game? I think um, Aubameyang looks like he might be injured again for the game, so I think I'd have to sit back. I'd have to sit back and play defensive. I'd go five at the back, three in the middle, and then um, two strikers. But I have the strikers sort of playing defensive, you know, um, on the midfielders and just trying to make a counter-attack goal with Saka um, on the counter-attack and Niketia and Lacazette. But it's going to be very tough for Arsenal. You just look at that Chelsea team. They've seen how other teams are winning games. They know Arsenal games are must-win if they want to keep in a title challenge. So it's not going to look good for Arsenal. Now Chelsea got a, an excellent 3-0 win on paper. I think that scoreline flattered them. But what did you think of them in terms of their performance? Does it really matter after back-to-back defeats? Was it all about just getting the win? No, I don't think it matters in sort of at that moment. It doesn't matter. But um, probably privately, I would imagine the Chelsea coaching staff were wouldn't have been as sort of jubilant as you ordinarily would after a 3-0 win against a difficult opponent in, in West Ham. I mean, they got the, the early goal from the, the, the set piece and they've been really good at set pieces all season long, Chelsea. But the next sort of 60, 70 minutes, mm. the, no football or fluidity in their play whatsoever. It was really yeah. disjointed. And West Ham had a, didn't create loads of chances, but they had a lot of moments where the final ball wasn't quite right or the, the final decision wasn't... Um, spot on, you know that they were getting overloads down the sides, and you know you just weren't putting the crossing quite right. And um, I was, yeah, it wasn't a very good performance. It was really odd um, performance from Chelsea. Lampard will probably say, "Well, we've played better at times, and you drop points, and you know, and over a course of a season, that does happen." Um, ultimately. They've won three 0 and not played well, so mm. that's that's not a bad thing, is it? It's not a bad thing. I saw you nodding a lot there, Gabby. Yeah, because I think I watched the game and like, I was so disappointed in Werner. I mean, like he's got so much to offer, so much potential, but the chances he was missing, it was like um, watching a player who's never played at high level before. Pulisic wasn't very good. We've seen Havertz is in and out of the team. We yet to see these players, and I feel like with with Lampard, I don't think he knows his best team. He's got probably too many players to choose out of. Hudson and Doyle on the bench. I feel like he's, um, he's he's looking at his squad and thinking like, who do I play? He's probably sitting there before games and like, got probably two teams he can choose and maybe like, picks one team out and say, you know, I'll play that team this game because they've got so many great players and they should be um, beating West Ham comfortably and playing a lot better football. Just on Timo Werner, so what do you think his best position is? Is it as a, a centre forward or is it maybe coming off the left? Uh, I think and what did you make of his comments as well? Does, even now, saying that he's, he's struggling to adapt to the pace of the Premier League. Would you I, I, think that? He's, I think he's a striker. I think he's um, a number nine with a Havertz behind him or a Ziyech behind him, um, putting through balls in like he does for Germany. On the left, he seems a bit lost. You know, it, there was a chance, I think, in the second half where... He, cut, he got the ball played and it was the perfect position for a Thierry Henry bender and he's took another touch and a weak shot of his left foot. He looks a bit short of confidence in his um, goal scoring but we've seen in previous games against Newcastle when he went on that run, the pace he's got. So we can sort his finishing now, he'll be a great player and yes it's a new league isn't it? I think everyone does understand how fast the Premier League is. A lot of players come to it and struggle and I think you look at Havart so far, he hasn't um, showed the £90 million fee, he hasn't done anything for me so far, so maybe these two need a season before we see the best mm. of them. So your Betfred selection for this one? Well, I'm going to go Chelsea 3-0. I look at this Chelsea team and I just feel like Arsenal, I don't think they know what teams to play, what teams he's, he's going to choose. I just feel like Chelsea are going to have too much for them. Mark? Chelsea win, and if you do want a first goal scorer, I think Timo Werner might be the one. He can't keep missing mm-hmm. these opportunities. Totally agree with, with Gabby as well that um, he's not a left winger. I, I think it, it's misunderstood because he does some good work out wide. He's being played out wide, but he's a striker that wants to drift into those positions rather than start there. So I think you want to see the best of Werner getting through the middle, but it won't matter in this game. OK, full house. Chelsea to win 2 nil. We shall see. OK, next up, game preview for it is Manchester City against Newcastle. And City are in the Carabao Cup semi-final, but they're eight points off Liverpool in the Premier League, albeit with a, a game in hand. Now, they were my pre-season favourites 
for the title. Really disappointed, I think, how they've sort of come back. But what's your take on why they haven't been right up there with Liverpool? It's strange, isn't it? I mean, I watched the Southampton game and I'm like, there's something missing, isn't there? Like even De Bruyne, the way he's, um, he's shooting at the moment, he's not finishing chances where he would do. He's not scored from open play this season. There have been penalties he scored. I feel like Gabriel Jesus has not been the same player. They've missed Aguero. And I feel maybe Pep can change his team a bit too much. We've seen Mares early on in the season have some good games. He's not started recently. So maybe it's too much um, rotation in the team and they're missing that clinical striker in Aguero. And mm. you look at him recently, he's been on the bench and not coming on. You don't know how fit he actually is and maybe it's something that they look to change and maybe bring in another striker. Do you think they should bring in another striker? Someone yeah, like I think, yeah, I think they need to. They need to break the bank for one now because Aguero, how many injuries he's had. You know, Manchester City can't afford to have a striker like him out. You look at the Champions League as well and different competitions. They need to have that clinical number nine. And I don't think Gabriel Jesus is that man. He's good to come in in a few games, but they need to be the Manchester City that got a marquee signing. For me, Haaland is the only player they need to go and get. In terms of Newcastle, I mean, I, I think Steve Bruce has done a good job to keep them away from the relegation zone. No one's ever really talked about them this season for that. And they're one of those clubs that could have done, but the fans aren't 100% behind him, and they would have been really disappointed with that Carabao Cup game last night. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, you know, they've been. It wasn't a great game, but the, if you looked at who played the football, it was Brentford, and Brentford can are a really good footballing team, and it kind of shows you up a little bit. If you're supposed to be the Premier League team and you, you've got a different style of play, I think there, there are probably two different arguments. I think Steve Bruce himself can look and say, I've done a good job here because he's remit you know, from Mike Ashley is to keep the team up and to do that however he sees fit You know, to, to do it. I think if you're a fan you want to see a bit more ambition from your club or you want to see them play in, uh, you know, because it's entertainment. At the end of the day, it's a job to Steve Bruce, but it's entertainment to the Newcastle fans. And I mean, I'm really bored. When I watch Newcastle, it, it like the football is, is not good. But if he opens up, are they not going to have more chance of losing? Yeah, so, yeah, and then he I, loses his job. Yeah, and, and so I totally understand where, where Steve Bruce does what he does. Um, and a lot of the anger is aimed more at Mike Ashley and, and sort of that lack of ambition, I suppose, in that he only wants to keep the team up. And if they finish 16th or whatever, he's happy with that. And Steve Bruce will, will give himself feel like he's done a good job. But I, I think the Newcastle fans are well within their rights to, to, to dream for more than, than just staying up in the Premier League and to try and be a better side. And you know, Leeds got a lot of criticism after what happened at United last week. But at least have fun, and you know I know that was six two, and get Gabby's had, had a pop at Leeds <laughs> um, himself. But you know he can Brentford, for instance, they play good football. Like you'd rather watch Brentford on a week by week basis than you would Newcastle. And so I totally get where the fans are coming from, but I understand why Steve Bruce just wants to keep his job and keep Newcastle up. Gabby, how do you see it, and what's your bet Fred selection for this game? So I think I think it's hard with Steve Bruce because you. you Fans want him to play this amazing football, but where are the players for it in that squad? They've not got a number 10 who can get on the ball and make things happen in the squad. They've not got them sort of players. What they've got is good players who will work hard for the team and um, get you results. The Frasers, the um, Almirons, the Wilsons, the Jolintons, the Gales, they're not going to get in number 10 positions and make things happen. So Newcastle fans want things that aren't capable. If Steve Bruce was given... 50, 60 million in January to bring in more creative players, I'm sure we will do and change the style of football. But there's no point in trying to play like Brentford and then losing every game. Mm. We've seen Norwich do it last season and go down. Steve Bruce isn't going to do that and send Newcastle down. He wants to keep Newcastle in the Premier League. I'm sure he will take the Pelters as long as he keeps them in the league. And then if eventually the club want to change things, then let them do it as long as he's done his job with the players he's got available and played the football to try and get results rather than play open. Totally agree. So how do you see this game? Um, I think it's going to be tough, but I do see Newcastle playing um, five at the back, playing three in the middle. We've seen West Brom frustrate Manchester City. I feel like Newcastle will have the same tactics as West Brom. So I'm going to go a 2-0 to Man City. I think they'll get the goals like they should have against West Brom with the chances they missed. But I don't think Newcastle will go there and get battered. I, I agree with you on that, and I've gone for City with a handicap of minus two. What are you going for? Uh, Man City to win to nil. I think they're defending really well at the moment. John Stones and Diaz seem to have got a good partnership, and 
I think Newcastle might look at other games as more realistic over Christmas to, to get some points <laughs> from. If they get a point out of this, they've done absolutely fantastic, yeah, haven't they? Yeah. OK, next up, it is Game Preview 5, Liverpool against West Brom. And if the City-Newcastle game might be one-sided, what about this one? I mean, how good were Klopp's men against Palace? It was crazy, wasn't it? I was watching the game and I was like, wow. Um, to leave Salah on the bench and be so comfortable, then he comes on and the two goals and an assist, it's crazy. And maybe this Liverpool team needed that game against Fulham, where they struggled in the first half, to now go into games and start on the front foot and not leave it to the second half. So you fear for West Brom now with um, defensive midfield a lot, Livermore out. And I think Sam Adol should be scratching his head for this game thinking, I don't know what team to play. Mm. It is a strange season and we're all hoping that three, four, maybe even five, six teams can be in with a shout for the title at the end of the season. But is there a danger that Liverpool could be pulling it away? Yeah, I was. Uh, it, it's, it's funny because I see it as like Liverpool started the season and thought, come on then, let's have a few of these, have a little go with us like a boxing match and then bam, let's finish this now and that's what they're going to do now. You can see Liverpool team saying, you know what, joke's over now, all the talk about Spurs and Chelsea, no, 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 we're going to go on a run now and have this wrapped up like last season. I could see them going on a big run and getting a 12, 15 point gap because they look unstoppable. You, you fancy them to beat West Brom comfortably and you look at the games that Spurs and Chelsea have got coming up, they look like they might drop points. You wouldn't surprise you with Spurs lost the Wolves and the gap become bigger. What do we make of Big Sam's first game in charge? Uh, uh, it was, the, the red card didn't help, and uh, but it wasn't great before the red card, really. I mean, I think he'll just be looking to get to January and try to bring in his own type of players that, that he wants and probably going to need. And, but it was no different to when um, Slavin Bilic was in charge, really. I mean, you know, they haven't got very good players, um, so they're going to struggle in, in a lot of matches, and that's the way it is for them. I think Allardyce, I mean, Allardyce was the last manager to win, wasn't yes, he? Yeah, uh, domestic uh, manager to win. Uh, Over three and a half years ago. Yeah, um, I, I think Allardyce is one of those type of guys, though, that will target certain and specific matches and there are easier matches <laughs> to come for them and more important games to come than a match away to Liverpool. So he has picked teams before when he's had a packed schedule where he focuses on easier matches. So maybe have a look at the, the team news first, but it wouldn't mm. surprise me if there were a couple of players. I, I think wrestling. though like, you, can, you can have his record of keeping teams, in, keep, keeping teams up, but sooner or later... It ends, doesn't it? You, is you this his most difficult job yet? Yeah, and I think this is the job where his record goes and the West Brom go down, yeah. and this is his last job. And I think West Brom will regret getting rid of Billets once the season's done because he had them playing against West Brom, I mean, against Manchester City. They were fighting for him, and I think it's um, disgusting that he got the sack. And Allardyce now coming in, what are they going to give him in January if they know they're so far off? Staying up, they're not going to give him loads of money, so it's going to be tough for him to keep them up. I defended Slavin as well. I, I yeah. think that was very, very harsh. I now know that you're not going to be on Big Sam's Christmas card list. <laughs> <laughs> Bet Fred selection for this one. I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go six nil to Liverpool. Yeah, I feel like they're going to just run riot. Salah's going to be hungry for goals. He's going to be back in the team because he got rested, and I just think Liverpool is going to have some fun against that West Brom team. Yeah, I think there's going to be a bigger gap than the, the Man City Newcastle game. I've gone for Liverpool handicap minus three. What have you gone for? Gabby's not a favourite of those at the Hall Forms before. <laughs> <laughs> so, how are you going to make it worse? He's uh, not enjoying no, saying no, bad no, things because about Because I've Albion. seen Mane come off against um, Crystal Palace fuming because he wants more goals. They've got players in there that aren't happy with a 2 0 win. They're carrying on to the 90th minute to get goals. They've got competition there with Salah and then Mane that you can tell they want to be the top goal scorer. So I'll just see them being relentless against West Brom and yeah. I'm going for Liverpool um, and over two and a half goals in the game. And I expect you know, all of them to come from Liverpool, I suppose. As well. Okay, interesting. <sighs> Big Sam's going to be in for another <laughs> tough one. <laughs> game preview six is Wolves against Spurs. And, and Mark, since we were last together, Spurs have played two, lost two. Jose Mourinho said something about Jurgen Klopp, you know, first he said they were the better team at Anfield, then he criticises touchline antics, then he said that Hansi Flick should have won the FIFA Best <laughs> Coach Awards. <laughs> He's not going to be on Klopp's uh, Christmas card no, list, No, I, I mean, that sort of just made me think, that he, before the Leicester game, he really still felt that Tottenham could win the league because he... You know, he kept on having a go at Klopp, and he only he only does that if he feels like he's got 
a chance, you know, and he, he's sort of mixing it. The Leicester game was um, a big step backwards. I thought in, against Liverpool, first half, Tottenham struggled. In the second half, I mean, they've created more chances than a lot of teams that, that go to Anfield, and Bergwijn really should have put at least one of them away, and they probably you know, could have come back out of it with a point. I Leicester. wonder what the percentage of they won the they, they won the expected goals count, so Arteta will put that as a, a, a <laughs> the Tottenham should have had three points. The Leicester game was a big step backwards. It was more like the Everton one on the opening day of the season. Leicester were first to every ball. I think if you were looking to make excuses for Spurs, you could say it was at the end of a really tough run of fixtures where they played. Arsenal was a North London derby, but they played Chelsea, they played City, they played Liverpool. Mm. Um, and also the two goals were joke goals for, from their point of view, really. Lloris didn't actually make a proper save in the game either. So they didn't give up that many opportunities. But the, uh, the, the football, when it goes bad for Jose, um, it doesn't look good, does well, it? I think as well, people that haven't played the game don't realise that you do get tired. They are human beings. They're playing every game. They don't really change the team. Son and Kane, they look tired. Even Sissoko in midfield, Holberg, they look tired and as players. And you, you could even uh, agree, sometimes when you play that many games in a row, you are tired in a game, you've got nothing. And that's what it looked like against Leicester. Yeah. They didn't have anything in the locker. You lose the edge, don't you? I, I actually used to be the first 20 minutes, not the last 20 minutes. Yeah, I yeah, couldn't move yeah. my feet properly. And then once I got into the game, I was OK. The natural yeah. fitness came. But the first 20 minutes when you're playing every two or three days. And, and, the, and they're running a lot now. These players are running a yeah. lot in games. With Jose Mourinho, it's non-stop pressing and running. So it was always going to be tough against a Leicester team who Ndidi and Tielemans won everything in that midfield. They look fit as well. And they've got quality in Madison and Vardy as well. So I think it's maybe a time for Jose to even start Gareth Bale in the game well, and make some changes. Really interesting you said that, because before we move on to Wolves, I wanted to ask you that he's gone a little bit under the radar, Gareth Bale, hasn't he? I mean, what's happened there? I was saying this to some of my friends in group chat, because um, when he first come, I said on the radio that um, I don't think it's, I think it's a panic signing. I think that he's not going to be the player that he used to be, and the wages that Spurs are going to be paying, they could have used on someone else. I mean, what with 13 games in, and... He scored one goal, he hasn't started um, a game yet and it's looking like that, isn't it? Because he doesn't look like the same player. I've not seen him take anyone on yet or run past someone at speed. So maybe Jose Mourinho has seen that and seen that he can't start him. I said exactly the same thing uh, back then as well. What's your take is it from a Spurs fan as much as a professional? I, I, yeah, I think um, from a Spurs fan's point of view, I think you, he hasn't quite got a run of games going yet um, and maybe he would get better if he started a few but coming off the bench he hasn't and it hasn't really made much of an impact apart from against Brighton the Europa League like it's such a reserve team that they play there's no kind of fluid way that they, they can't get he can't no. get connected with Son and Kane because he hasn't really played with them yet but I also I am concerned as to whether he trusts his body because he doesn't seem to he seems to be playing within himself yeah. as if he doesn't want to get injured and Michael Owen spoke a lot about sort of you know the, the way that you um, you protect yeah. yourself I suppose and it looks well, like that. they'll look back in May and they'll be like okay what's he cost us in wages and that'll be used against Spurs and like is it was it a good signing or was it if he gets 10 goals, you might be like, he was OK. But if he gets five, you'd be like, OK, you got five goals for 10, 15 million pounds, 20 million pounds yeah. you spent on wages. So, And I get the feeling it was the hierarchy's decision rather than Jose Mourinho to bring him in, although we, we, we don't know. So how do Wolves take advantage of where Spurs are at at the moment? I think it's going to be one of the, the similar sort of games to Leicester um, and Spurs. I feel like it's going to be both teams are going to be weary. Who, do, do we want to attack or do you want to attack um, at the start of the game? I think Wolves will still play their five at the back. I think Spurs will want to play their counter-attack football. So I'm going to go a bit weary in the first 30 minutes. But if Podence and Neto can get on the ball, I think it can cause um, Spurs' defence problems. We've seen the way Jamie Vardy and Madison done it. So I think it'll be an interesting game. OK, your bet Fred selection for this one? So I'm going to go with... High scoring game. I think it's going to be um, close early doors, but I feel like once Podence and Nettle get into the game and Son and Kane, I feel like I can get goals. So I'm going to go to 3 2 to Spurs. Are you? With Harry Kane, hat trick, I'm going to go. Oh. Ah. He's due goals, you know, he's missed out with Son scoring more than him. I feel like he's going to be hungry for goals. I think this is a hard game for Spurs. Um, they've not done very well away from home. Drew with Crystal Palace, only just great past Burnley and West Brom and Wolves. Did Chelsea, didn't they, um, in their last game at Molyneux? 
I'm going to go for Wolves or draw a double chance, and Wolves not to lose the game. Are you? I'm going to agree how it's going to start. I think with Raul Jimenez, the average goals per game is much lower than, than, than with him. Yeah. Um, so I don't think Wolves are going to score in this one. I think it's going to be a really tight game. Yeah. I think Spurs are going to nick it. Take your pick between Kane and Son. But yeah. I've gone for Son, but I think Spurs will nick this 1-0. Yeah. OK, let's uh, have a look at our fantasy football picks. We pick a player who we think will be absolutely outstanding this weekend. I know you'll be outstanding off the pitch, uh, Gabby. What about on the pitch? Who have you gone for? Um, so I've chose Kane. I feel that um, when Harry Kane goes a couple of games without a goal, he's so hungry for goals. We've seen against Leicester. He was getting so many shots off in, in places where he wouldn't even shoot from because he's desperate to score goals. And um, if it's a penalty, a free kick or a long ranger, I'm going to see Harry Kane getting goals. So I'm going to go with him as my pick and he's my captain. OK, Mark? I'm going for a striker, but Patrick Bamford uh, of Leeds got nine already and you don't have to concern yourself with how bad they are defensively because it just needs Bamford to score goals. They create a lot of chances. He's taking the chances. Seems to be a confident striker and I think he's, you know, he's got that kind of good feeling uh, you know, when he's getting his chances, taking them more than he did in the Championship, which yeah. is a little bit odd. They've got a couple of nicer fixtures coming up, Leeds as well, starting with Burnley, so I'll go for Bamford. Just on that, Gabby, can you explain why he's doing better in the Premier League than, than he was in the Championship? I've said this to strikers in lower leagues that are, that are friends of mine, that sometimes the Premier League can be easier for strikers than it is a Championship. Championship, it's like a lot of hook the ball on and you know, fighting for um, second balls in Championship League One, League Two. In the Premier League, it's more get the ball down and like when you when you're a striker and you can make good runs, you can get found by better players. And you look at Bamford's goals this season, his chances. He's not even the quickest of strikers, but he's getting in behind defenders because he's clever at his runs. He's getting the passes at the right time. So that's why the Premier League sometimes can be easier. Mm. Okay, I've gone for Sadio Mane. You mentioned earlier about mm -hmm. he was really annoyed to be taken off yeah. at Crystal Palace. He knew he was sitting there, wasn't he, thinking, I could be getting at least yeah. a hat-trick here. Yeah. And you're right also about that rivalry between yeah, him and, and Mo Salah. So the reason I always go Salah, though, is because he takes penalties. That's why I always favour Salah as my captain if I choose a Liverpool player. Only that reason, because Liverpool get pens all the time and VAR <laughs> now. If you're a penalty taker, you're laughing, aren't you? That's why I always choose Salah. Why don't you just killed my choice now? <laughs> <laughs> you see where I'm coming from, though? <laughs> you see where I'm coming from? Penalties go I order. see exactly where you're coming from. Until you're saying Liverpool get the penalties all the time. Yeah. But like, I think everyone now fancy football. Like, I play the game, my friends. Everyone chooses a captain who takes penalties. Yeah. So everyone will choose Kane before Son because he takes the penalties. Fernandez before Rashford is your captain because he takes the penalties. Because there's that many penalties that are going to be given now for little fouls that aren't fouls. That slow you, motion that look worse exactly. in slow so motion. Exactly, you've got to be more penalties, so yeah. it makes sense. I'm still going for Mane. You see yeah. that anger in his face. <laughs> being taken oh, no. he's, he's, he's not going to pass. Nah, he won't, he won't. OK, final one, the team treble. We all pick a team that we think is going to win this weekend. Uh, Gabby, who have you gone for? I've gone for Manchester United. I feel like they're in frightening form at the moment and their attack will have too much for Leicester's defence. That's a tough one, though, isn't it? Leicester. Yeah, yeah, it will be tough, but I just fancy them at the moment. The way they're playing, like Rashford against Leeds was frightening. Like the best performance I've seen him in a while, and I feel like they'll do the same against Leicester. Okay, Mark, you've had to change yours, haven't you? I was going to be Portsmouth. I'm going Aston Villa. I'm surprised Gabby. I'm still surprised Gabby hasn't chosen oh, me Aston too. Villa. But bit of reverse psychology. <laughs> you know, I, that's I, it. I think that Villa are playing really well um, to all departments at the moment. Right, defence is keeping clean sheets. The attack looks lively. Grealish is in, you know, in unbelievable form, sort of linking everything together. And Crystal Palace. I'm a little bit wary because teams can bounce back from when they're humiliated like that. But um, one clean sheet this season, mm. that, that, that would concern me. Yeah, I, I'm dipping into the Championship. I think Swansea, with Bournemouth's games being called off as well, they win, they go into the automatic promotion places. A great little carrot for the incentive for the players. Up against the QPR side, no win in seven. Um, yeah, I, I, I fancy Swansea for that one. That's it, Gabby. Yeah. What are you up to Christmas time? Um, waiting for the tier football four to yet, start. Are you? No, <laughs> no, I think we're tier one, so I might be uh, on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Birmingham. <laughs> With your no, can of Budweiser. It's it. No, but I'll be waiting for the football to start on the unboxing day. Looking forward to it. Okay, listen, it's been great to see you. And, you and I'll be seeing you in the Chelsea yeah, Villa game as well. Looking forward to, well. it. Looking forward to that one over, over Zoom. Mark, what are you up to over Christmas? 
um, eating and drinking, and then working Boxing Day. So um, yeah, you can only um, you can only rest for so long. You can enjoy. Okay, well that's it for this week's Different League show, the last one before Christmas. Hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be back next week where we'll look back at the, the Boxing Day games and also look ahead to the games coming up as well. Don't forget, please gamble responsibly. And from everyone here on behalf of Betfred and also the Racing Post, a very Merry Christmas.